Anna, architect and illustrator, and I make hand drawings from this space most days. And I'm currently locked down in East London with my toddler and husband, who's also an architect. I was asked by the London Festival of Architecture to make a drawing masterclass to form part of this year's LFA Digital Festival with the theme of London in 2050 and how it might look, which is quite a lofty ambition. So my goal is to inspire you to make a drawing, possibly a painting or even a poem, which allows you to imagine a possible future of London, unbound by the rules of planning permission and those other mandanities which constrain our thoughts. When we're little, we draw lots. We don't care what it looks like, whether it can perform to a particular style, we just go for it. And that's something I think we benefit from embracing. Uh, it's not just about what it looks like. The most important thing is that you make it. And that's why I've always resisted the idea of teaching a drawing technique, um, because it's not really as important as the act of making it and thinking and what it tells you once you've made it. The way I draw is very much born of me being an architect. Um, it's lots of pen work, quite detailed, and it's of a particular style, but it, it isn't the right the right way to do it and uh, there are lots of architects who draw in lots of different ways and I'll show you some examples as we go through. There's something to bear in mind as we go through. You draw, make a drawing however you'd like to uh, and I'd love to see them once we're finished. I think drawing is an excellent way to explore your ideas and how you feel about the world in an acutely simple way so your brain is connected to your pen or pencil and the paper and it's not muddy like technology or anything else in between. So before the workshop, we asked you to think about a few themes that may affect the way that London will look in 2050. So climate change, uh, how will we work, how will we get around, those sorts of things. And uh, choose a London landmark that you would like to reimagine. Um, so my drawing will very much be in this vein, but it will take me a few hours. So the video will be sped up for the purposes of today. Um, so please don't try and keep up or your arm might fall off. Um, but I'm going to show you some examples now of smaller scale drawings that can easily be achieved in the time frame. And the techniques that I show you, you can scale up from the size of a postage stamp to the size of your wall. It's uh, really however much time and space you have. I make drawings of all different scales and sizes. Um, today I'm going to make an A3 drawing, uh, which will take a little while. But here are some of uh, exactly the same theme and style which I'll go through in the steps, which took me about 30 to 45 minutes. So you might want to have a go at something like this. They're all silly suggestions for what might happen to the tall buildings in the city of London in the future. So the art of making work which envisions the future, whether it be utopian or dystopian in nature, is certainly not a new thing. People have been doing it for 500 years or so, probably longer. Um, so let's look at some examples. So this book is all about utopia, which would be your idyllic vision of the future. Um, it has a few different examples. Here's one of a postcard in New York in 1913, which has all manner of interesting ways to move about. High level railways, planes and an airship. And then going much further back, there's a 15th century painting of Venice, which I think is brilliant. The colours are just great. There's a complete disregard of any scale or perspective, obviously, of its time. Um, and the water really looks like it's gushing out of there. And I also love that they've used wallpaper instead of sky. Next up is a history of London in maps. And I just wanted to show you one drawing from here. Um, just because when you're thinking about the future, it can be an idea to look back at how London used to be for some ideas. So this is London Bridge. It used to be inhabited. It used to have buildings all over it. People used to live there. Uh, and I'm wondering if we run out of space in the future, why couldn't we build over the water? This is an interesting book. This is projects that were never realised in London, London as it might have been. Um, and a lot of the projects are to do with transport and how the city operates and how people move around, um, which I thought was quite interesting to look at. Uh, so this one is from 1967 
and shows some overhead trains suspended from a monorail in the middle of Regent Street, which is quite incredible. Next up is this huge structure for a helicopter landing platform on the roof of Liverpool Street Station. Uh, then we have this from 1863 to, de to deal with the congestion of people um, on the street, allowing them to safely cross the street without encountering traffic, which in those days was obviously horse and cart. Um, and this, this one, slightly off the idea of transport and into the folly, uh, in 1891, London built the foundation for its very own Eiffel Tower in Wembley Park and announced a design competition to design it. Um, and here are some of the silly ideas. It was going to be 150 foot taller than the Eiffel Tower, and they said at the time, anything Paris can do, London can do better. This is the last example of some visions of the future, um, and I can't talk about this without have adding in some humour and the best person to look at for that is Heath Robinson. And here's Heath himself with his drawing pad. Uh, he was a cartoonist in the late 19th, early 20th century and these so these drawings are about 100 years old but they're so relevant today and our current lockdown situation. The book's called How to Live in a Flat and it suggests lots of fun ways to improve your home. Um, here's the residents of a block doing a workout by a guy in a balloon, perhaps the Joe Wicks of his day, um, as a suggestion of how to mitigate the effects of late night piano solos by filling your ceiling cavity with footballs. Um, there's the bungalow kitchenette, which adds a second floor into your tiny kitchen to get some more cupboard space. Note the baby in a little drawer on the wall. Uh, this is the open air bungalow for warm weather, admirably simple in construction. Uh, and worked by an inexpensive bedside winch. The liftable roof enables the tenant to enjoy all the benefits of sleeping in the open without any of the risks. And here's how to get a few more people round for dinner by winching them up above the dining table. And this is my favourite one. How to hang your washing out if you don't have a garden. A washing line with presumably a helium-filled balloon at the end of it. So let's get back to our London 2050. Um, right now it's quite hard to think about the future you know, when we don't really know what's going to happen in two weeks, let alone months or years from now. But there are lots of possibilities. Um, we're told that the world's going to change more in the next 30 years than it has in the last 300, which is quite something. Um, the global population is going to grow to 10 billion from its current 7.8 billion. And London's population will become 13 million uh, from its 9 million today. So that's going to put extreme pressure on the city and its infrastructure. There's lots to think about. There are some big things that will affect how we live. Will the coronavirus disappear or will we continue to live with it? How will we manage to slow the effects of climate change, if that's at all possible? And will our jobs be done by robots? I've narrowed down my thoughts to a little script or a narrative of what I think might happen. I tend to do this for lots of drawings and I make the story a long time before I put any pen to paper. Um, so why don't you pause this video and see if you can write your own little narrative, um, but I'm just going to read you mine. It errs on the side of utopia, I think, rather than dystopia. I'm just going to read it out to you. It's 2050. You're walking around the city of London. There are trees everywhere. There is art everywhere. Above you in the sky, you hear the hum of drones as they whiz around, delivering parcels, collecting posts, and showing you the latest artwork. The skyscrapers are no longer full to the brim with office workers, as half of the people work from home now. Art and culture drive the economy here. SpaceX have built a base on the moon and are using it to, as a launch pad for missions to Mars the new billionaire playground. We've slowed the effects of climate change, but they weren't reversed. So you can now go on a diving holiday to see Venice underwater. The only vehicles at street level in the city are electric buses and driverless cars, taxis, mostly. Gone is the cycle superhighway replaced with the cycle super duper highway. 
an elevated cycle route which takes cycles up and away from other vehicles and the danger they pose. Usage of the tube is down by 50% from 2050, 2020 due to the increase in working from home and the use of the new cycle route. So the unused tube tunnels have been repurposed to grow vegetables in hydroponic farms. Data is everywhere. Your phone tells you the quality of the air around you, the time of the next piece of art will sail past you, and it wants to know how you're feeling today. All brought to you by 10G Internet. Wellness, physical and mental, has become the focus of the, all aspects of our life. So let's get back to our London 2050. Uh, right now, it's quite hard to think about the future when we don't really know what's going to happen in two weeks, let alone months or years from now. However, there are lots of possibilities. We're told that the world's going to change more in the next 30 years than the last 300, which is quite something. Um, the global population is going to grow from 7.8 billion today to 10 billion in 2050. And London's population will become 13 million from 9 million today. So it's going to put an extreme pressure on our city and its infrastructure. So there's lots to think about. Big things that might affect how we live. Will the coronavirus disappear or will we need to learn to live with it? Um, are we going to manage to slow the effects of climate change? Will our jobs be done by robots? Let's see if we can turn it into a drawing. So, first things first, paper. I like to use a textured paper um, of varying different degrees. This one is quite smooth, but it still has a bit of a, a bump in it, and I like the way that it absorbs uh, colour and shade. Um, but feel free to use whatever you have. So next up is a pencil, and then we need a rubber and a ruler. Um, I also use these Unipin liners of different nib sizes. I think I've got a 0 0.05, a 0 0.1, and a 0.4. Then I have some watercolour brush pens of different shades of grey for shading. And finally, some colour brush pens and some pro markers to add some colour at the end. Use whatever you're comfortable with and what you have to hand. My drawing process generally has four stages, which I'll explain as we go along. Um, but if you haven't quite finished when I move on to the next one, please feel free to pause video and catch up at your own pace. So this is the first stage, uh, which is sketching out. Um, I'll start by setting out the drawing limits uh, on the page, the area I'm going to draw within. Some people will start at one end and end up at the other. It's completely up to you. Um, I'll then put on some rough guides of the centre lines and set out the ground, middle and sky portions. And then I'll just go for it with all the ideas that I've got. So let's get going. The centre of the drawing is going to be the walkie-talkie, otherwise known as 20 Fenchurch Street. Um, next to that is the gherkin, 30 St Mary Axe. And then picking up from behind those two is the Leadenhall building or the cheese grater. These three buildings for me, uh, I'm using them as to symbolise the city of London. I think I, I quite often draw these as characters because I think they've got personalities. Um, so I think it, we can make something quite interesting with those three buildings. Next, I'm going to add in some foreground buildings. Um, you rarely see the base of these towers from a distance. Um, so, and then we are worrying about what's in the ground, some train tunnels, some big cables and possibly a rat. As you can see, I'm a lefty, which means I should probably draw from right to left to avoid smudging, but I never do uh, unless I'm working on something large, which takes a few months. Uh, so I'll, if in that case, I'll use some tracing paper under my hand to protect the work. This composition of, is, of course, entirely made up. This is not how these buildings sit together in reality. But I think if they roughly sit in their relative places and they're sort of the right correct relative heights, I think that makes it recognisable as the City of London. 
Here's the moon base. I've no idea what it's going to look like yet, so it's just a bit of a scribble. I'll do a Heath Robinson here and flip the top of the gherkin to get some nice cool air into it. And let's have a roof garden and a pet cow, because of course we'll all be vegans by 2050. And let's add a garden to the roof of the cheese grater too. Um, this is the idea that uh, art galleries could become mobile uh, and drones could fly around carrying art, bringing it to you uh, instead of you travelling to go to a gallery and that maybe that might mean that more people will get to see art. Here's the Aviva Tower, which is a building I love. It has a really simple form. Um, and was, as with everything else, it's getting a roof garden. Uh, there's lots of trees at street level, lots of lovely London plane trees. The oldest plane tree in the city sits coincidentally in Wood Street. So let's replace these sterile rows with lots of lovely tree-lined avenues. And now for the star of the show, the Cycle Super Duper Highway. If you live in London, you've no doubt heard of the Cycle Super Highway. Well, this is just a bit more super than that. Um, it's elevated above the ground so that the cyclists are removed from dangers of other vehicles and it has an innovative track which generates electricity from motion of the cycles. I'm sure there are a few engineers with their heads in their hands right now, but bear with me. Um, and of course, even robots can ride it. So back underground, uh, here's a train in the underground tunnel, and next door in what is now a disused tunnel, as 50% less people use the tube network, it's a hydroponic farm which grows leafy green veg um, interestingly, this already happens actually deep underground in tunnels beneath Clapham. Uh, and I'll add, I'll add a building in section here just to emphasise that we're cutting a slice through the city. So that's it, all sketched out. So I'll leave you to sketch away um, and finish laying out your drawing. Um, and in the meantime, I'm going to show you some more examples of drawings by architects. This book is a collection of possibly my favourite drawings. Uh, it's by Alexander Brodsky and Ilya Utkin, who are Russian architects based in Moscow. In the 1980s, they were part of a group called the Paper Architects. Um, and along with my friend Ross, I actually interviewed them in 2012 for the Venice Architecture Biennale. They have some brilliant etchings, brilliant in skill, but also in content. Uh, okay, so by way of contrast, here are some other drawings by architects. Um, here's a, a, a good selection. There's a lots of variety, some quick and sketchy, some more formal, um, some black and white, some detailed, some really colourful drawings. Um, basically, as you can see in the world of architects' drawings, anything goes. Okay, next up, next stage of the drawing. Um, I would normally go over the roughed out pencil lines with a pen, um, sometimes using a ruler as well, correcting things and then rubbing out pencil as I go. So I'm left with a pen and ink outline of everything on the page. 
just adding some detail to the underground cables here. Um, London has aspirations to become a smart city, and so data is going to become incredibly important in its future. There's even there's already a GLA funded open source location for data of all kinds on the internet called the London Data Store. And apparently London has the largest network of air quality monitors in the world. So I think we're going to need a lot of cables for all that high speed internet. Sometimes I like to add in an animal or two. Um, so let's add in a pigeon, I think, because you can barely go anywhere in London without seeing a pigeon. Um, and I think it also helps to make a drawing of its place. If I was making a drawing Havana in Cuba, I might add in a flamingo, for example. Um, and also things like this help it to pass the toddler, toddler test. Uh, if my toddler thinks that a drawing is fun, then I consider it a success. So we've now got the drawing all set out and inked up and the next step is to fill in the details. I always hatch windows in black because if you look out the window they appear black because of the reflection. Um, some people will show them blue or white. Uh, if I had a bit more time and there were, this drawing was bigger I might try and so show some reflection in the windows as well so you could try that. Um, so here's our walkie talkie distribution centre where you can order your new home office equipment, uh, have it collected from the Sky Terrace by drone and delivered across the city to your door or maybe your roof. So I'm just adding in some detail here to the ground beneath the City of London as, as though we're cutting a slice through the strata um, so there'll be different kinds of rock formations and mud and whatever else sometimes I would also add uh, maybe a dinosaur fossil uh, maybe a Roman clay pot in there who knows just something to give it a bit more a life Um, whilst I'm hatching away here, let's have a look at some other people who are masters of hatching and adding detail. So no uh, discussion about drawing will be complete without showing you Giovanni Piranesi. He is a legend in the ink world. Uh, this is a hefty book with his entire collection of etchings and it's really worth a look at. But <sighs> this is a brilliant photo. Here's Piranesi looking like a Greek god. Today I just wanted to show you his use of hatching. Um, the way he shows the light in this drawing is incredible. But also I, I really love these drawings which are fireplace drawings. Um, there are so many of them. I don't know why he was obsessed with drawing fireplaces but I think it's really interesting the way he's drawn the fire differently in each one and the sort of care and attention to drawing the fire. And I think what I'm trying to sort of say here is that, that it's the little things that you might think are too insignificant to draw but they actually can really make a drawing and give it life. And then about 150 years after Piranesi we have these beautiful drawings by Madge Gill who was born in East London actually in Walthamstow in 1882. Um, she was a self-taught artist um, and her these dreamy, um, really heavily detailed, beautiful drawings, they were apparently guided by a spirit and in fact she never sold any of her work for fear of angering the spirit. Um, so I wonder what your spirit guide will tell you to make today. These photos are from the Magical archive at magical.com. Stephen Wiltshire, who is an artist I've always admired, unlike me, who needs to have an image in front of me while I'm drawing, 
to copy, Stephen is able to draw from memory um, and he's been drawing London landmarks since he was seven. Uh, he's, a, he's able to make these amazing drawings having only seen a view for a really short time. Um, these are his drawings in the city and I think they're just brilliant. These images are all taken from Stephen's website, stephenwiltshire.co.uk. So we've reached our fourth and final stage of drawing, which is definitely the most fun bit, uh, adding the colour. I've always been a bit scared of colour and I don't tend to colour everything, just a few key things. I'm going to add the red first because it's the most fun uh, to my post drone here, which has WR on the side as a potential reference to uh, King William, as he may be on the throne by then. Then we're going to add lots of greenery. Um, I'm also going to add some brightly coloured clothes on the washing line here, um, because yes, the Gherkin is now a residential tower. I, have, uh, I actually saw some discussion last week on Twitter about whether hanging washing lines out in uh, ruins the look of your beautiful finished building. Personally, I love it, and I think there's nothing lovelier than walking around Venice on wash day. We're just adding some nice blue into the billboard here on top of the building. Uh, it's advertising a diving holiday to Venice to see the Rialto Bridge underwater. Um, and all those lovely buildings. Imagine how different that would be to see them from below. And you'd be able to see the uh, the wooden piles, maybe, that they're all sitting on. Um, and I suppose it's just thinking about if we can't alter the effects of climate change um, we might be able to halt them but poor Venice is already under threat um, so it's just thinking about how things might change. So we'll just think about shading now. Um, I'm going to get a big chunky pro marker um, the sunshine in my drawing is coming from the left hand side, so I'm going to colour in this whole face of the shard grey, which gives us some more, makes the facade seem more 3D um, if we colour in the part that the sun doesn't reach. Here's another shading technique I use. So I'll, with these water brush pens, um, they're great actually. I'll put in a thick dark line with the with the dark color, and then blend in with the lighter color, and it gives you a more graded gradient of shading uh, as opposed to a thick line. I thought it would be nice to finish up our drawing examples with Lina Bobardi here. She was an Italian architect practicing in Brazil in the mid to late 20th century um, and only one of only a few women architects of her generation. Uh, her drawings are brilliant. They're playful, they're really colorful, enviably free, um, and they're just so human. And we're done. Um, 
there's lots more I could have added. Um, and as we've been going along, I've been thinking about all the things I've missed out, like aliens, um, whether a drone could build a skyscraper. In any case, I'm going to stop talking now um, and I'll show you a time-lapse video of the making of this drawing from start to finish, accompanied by some ambient music. Um, so relax uh, and enjoy whilst you finish your own drawing and again feel free to pause if you need a bit more time. So we're all done. Uh, this is my drawing. Put it right way up. This is my drawing as it turned out. Um, I really hope you enjoyed the video today. Whether you made something large or small, or even smaller, um, I really hope it was fun and that you enjoyed thinking about London in 2050. We'd love to see your ideas, um, so please tag the London Festival of Architecture and use the hashtag #MyLondon2050 and have a lovely day.